Welcome to the WTFFF 3D Printing Podcast, all about the what of fused filament fabrication. Hey everyone, welcome to WTFFF. I'm Tom Hazard along with my co-host Tracy. And today we've got a really exciting interview and product to talk about, to share with you today. It's called Toy Box. So I was sitting in a um, round table discussion between I'm going to say it's more than startups. So like people who, who are growing their companies, a lot of them are fast growing, they're, they're getting more capital. And so it's a group, it's a networking between these founders of companies and investors, not because they're in active seeking and asking for money. There's, they're not making like presentations necessarily. We're just having conversations. So everybody knows they're still existing and they're still maybe in the mode of looking for future funding and other things like that. And so it's a way to keep the investment community connected with you as a founder. So I'm sitting in there and I meet Ben Baltas and Ben has cut this 3D printer in the background. And I'm like, what is this? And I could see him on Zoom because there's multiple founders going and he's like the third founder to go. And I'm just like dying and waiting to find out what's going on, what, the, what his company is, what it's about. And it turns out his company is Toy Box. And so he's the co-founder and CEO of Toy Box. It's a fast growing 3D printing company that, create, that creates a 3D printer and a creativity platform that allows kids to find the toys they want and print them at home. So I'm sitting there thinking, my daughter's going to go nuts. Linnea's going to love this. And Toy Box has redefined the 3D printing experience, which we have been saying needed it for so long, with a novel interaction model built from the ground up to enable everyday people, your average consumer, to print without any prior knowledge. Ben and his company has been featured on Shark Tank with prominent exposure on popular shows such as The Price is Right and Netflix's Atypical. Uh, more recently, Ben and his company was featured live on CNN, Yahoo Finance, ABC News, and on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And I can't believe we didn't see this printer before now. I cannot believe you and I have not found this. And we hadn't now. heard about it. I mean, because he's <laughs> been doing this, you know, behind the scenes for years. Uh, yeah. But I'm, I'm so glad you did trip on him yeah. through this, this group you network with. And we just had a fantastic interview with him. And honestly, I don't think we need to say much more before we go right to the interview, but we have a lot to talk about after. So hang around for that. So Ben Baltes from Toy Box. Hey, Ben, so glad you're here. You know, we bumped into each other on that um, in sort of like an investor startup circle kind of thing. And I was like, how did I not know about you before? So I'm so glad we're getting you on the show. Definitely. Thanks for having me. It's nice so, to meet the two of you. Yeah. So tell us about the start of Toy Box. Oh, the start. Um, so this goes back probably about four years ago. Um, we started very small. So, um, you know, kind of before we started this project, we actually had another project that was completely outside of toys, but involving 3D printing. And what we did or what we were working on at the time, I think this was probably five or six years ago when 3D printing was really booming and people had extremely high expectations was um, uh, essentially we realized that there's a lot of new technologies coming out for 3D printing, you know, whether that's automated build beds or, um, you know, new extrusion technologies, color printing, different materials. Um, and we thought it made a lot of sense to create a hardware platform that actually incorporated all these things. So um, essentially what we built was a very modular 3D printer and, um, very similar to kind of what Flux has now. It actually looked almost identical. And uh, we built this prototype and the, the thought process was all these new innovations are coming out, uh, but there wasn't a hardware or platform to really accept those changes. Essentially, if you wanted a dual extruder or you wanted a multicolor extruder, uh, you really had to buy a printer for that. Um, so we built this printer to all snap together. So if you wanted, you know, a multi, uh, color extruder upgrade, or, you know, you wanted to make it bigger, you just bought the components and you snapped it together, kind of like what Dell did for PCs. Um, so we got pretty far on that project. Uh, it, it was great. It could, you know, you could assemble it with these different pieces. It's read, it could read its configuration and then adjust its config settings dynamically. Uh, so it was very hands-off in that sense. 
But, you know, as we were finishing this hardware prototype, uh, we got to the point where we realized that, you know, even if we built this hardware prototype, there really wasn't a software system that could handle all these changes. You know, we could adjust the config, but, you know, if people wanted to print with color printing, it was a whole mess on on that front as well. Um, So that that got us really thinking. And, um, you know, we were three tech people building this thing and really 3d printing all the parts. Uh, so I was at Microsoft, me and my co one of my co-founders was at Microsoft. The other was at Workday. Um, but it took us a while to get pretty familiar with 3d printing. Uh, you know, I built my first 3d printer. It didn't work out of the box. I didn't know if it was, you know, because I assembled it wrong or, you know, the extruder was broken or what it turns out. It was just the model I was printing was messed up. So I, you know, I spent days debugging this thing only to find that the model was it, you know, uh, right You're on the speaking bed. To the choir here. Cause if, you know, for those of you who've been following our podcast from the beginning, which has been over six years now, right? Yeah. 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 And so from the beginning, this is what we were saying to everybody is like, we found that a lot of times it is your model and that it's right. a whole host of other things and that the software hasn't caught up. Like there's a whole list of things that you should do. And our goal with the podcast was to get you to stick around through this tough learning curve and to be the support system or bring you resources to do that because mm-hmm. it's worth it at the end. Like that's what we wanted everybody to get to. But we were the same way. Completely we were like, agree. build this thing and you don't know if you built it right. Like it right. always <laughs> confounded me, like how much user error there could be that it was just going to frustrate you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, we had the same thought process because once we got it working, we were obsessed, you know, um, we're printing all types of things. I think, you know, I have some shoes behind me that we printed. Um, you know, I printed all types of art that, you know, I designed was on the news for the first time because of that. Um, but you know, anything from helpful things around the house to just fun things. Um, it was really fun and I found it very valuable. And, For us, it was, um, you know, really considering the use case and being like, wow, there's a lot of room for human error. Uh, And a lot of it is integration, right? Because, you know, you buy this printer, usually you kind of have to build it, then you have to calibrate it, and then you have to usually get some type of open source software, configure it with a slicer, you know, and a lot of that's integration. And then you have to go online and you don't know if these models are going to work on your printer or not because you don't know the fundamentals of 3D printing. You don't want to print everything with support material. Um, So for us, you know, we were really considering how do we make this foolproof? You know, like how do we create something that is, you know, more similar to a consumer product? And I know it's probably what every 3D printing company claims, uh, but really it came from building this from the ground up uh, and really taking all of those friction points and, you know, interaction points between all the software and, and, and bundling it into one experience. Um, so, you know, we, we originally worked with an OEM on, on the printer and we upgraded some of those hardware components. Um, you know, uh, we have uh, a special bed that's magnetic um, that you can peel the prints off of. I think Ender uses it now. We were the first. Um, mm-hmm. All the way from, you know, these small hardware improvements to bundling it with the software. So, you know, if you change filament, you know, you're not going to fill it like extruder settings and heating it up. You're just cha- pressing the change filament button to, you know, being able to print from a pre-selected catalog, thousands of toys and pressing one button and, and, and just having it work. So, you know, to, to pull off that type of user experience, we really had to take all these components, create our own solution and, and put it together. So, you know, um, we got to work on that. Uh, a lot of it is, is software and content. So, um, the, we, everything, uh, works via web. So all you do is buy this printer, plug it in to the wall, connect to the internet, comes pre-calibrated, small build area. So you don't have to worry about, you know, it becoming uncalibrated, um, over time. And, and then, you know, you just open up our website or an app. You can print directly from the app and find something you like and just press print. So, you know, the, the good thing so is so easy. <laughs> like, you know, it, it's it seemed like it's about time, like, uh, you know, mm-hmm. that this stuff comes to to that place where the where the files, the designs, the printer and the software and the maintenance of it is all coming together into into one, you know, concise place and easy to use. Right. I mean, it, you reviewed, Tom, a lot of, I'm going to call mini printers, like small scale ones. Mm-hmm. And they all had a lot of problems, right? Talk a little bit. Well, yeah. I mean, we've, we reviewed a bunch of them and one of them that 
strikes me as being very similar in size and maybe intent to yours was the M3D, I think. And right. I, I, and I've experienced very, very difficult to use printers where everything is manual to everything on a high end printer that is a completely closed system. And I just could not get that M3D to work the way right. they said it would. And it was very frustrating. And to me, if I was a consumer buying that, I wouldn't have worked as hard as I did to try to get it to work. I would have packed it back up and returned it. Right. So that's, I think it's very important what you're going after in mm -hmm. creating a 3D printer that is so easy to use in every way. I think it's it's a fantastic thing you're doing and I'm excited about it, honestly. Right. Yeah, so Ben, are you seeing sort of a, a specific area of the market that's really responding well to, to what you guys have put together here? Right, so right now we're focusing on toys. You know, that's kind of our, our first market. Um, our thought process was, you know, 3D printers, even with the current technology has the potential to, to change a, a ton of people's lives that aren't enthusiasts and aren't, you know, 3d printing as experts. Um, what we did is we looked at the market and said, okay, with, you know, this existing technology, what's a large market that could, you know, be really benefited by 3d printing. Um, and, you know, we looked at all types of things, cosplay, you know, office supplies, art, all right, crafts. Crafts is a good one, but a lot of those people already know how to use 3D printers. Um, but toys really stood out for multiple reasons. Once a very large market, it's, you know, uh, something around $90 billion of toys are, are sold every year. And 90% of those are plastic. Uh, and on top of that, they're not biodegradable plastic. So, you know, uh, PLA uh, has some questions about how it's biodegradable. You know, you have to bring it to a composting facility. There's a few in the U.S., uh, so they make their ways there. But it's much, much better than, you know, uh, plastic toys that can only be recycled once or twice. Um, you know, on top of that, you, you know, the amount of uh, uh harm this is causing to the environment just in terms of transportation and logistics right. uh, of, of moving those toys really you know what you're doing is you're buying raw material uh it's one shipment to your house and then you can just print hundreds of toys off of that it, it it does a lot of good um but ultimately what it came down to was you know what what's something that people are willing to pay you know in the two three hundred dollar range uh and can benefit a lot of and it, it turns out you know a lot of people 3d printers they just print toys anyway Right. Um, so it, it seemed like a prime market and we're focusing on that, but our, our goal, you know, isn't just the toys market. It's to create a 3d printer that's easy for everyone to use. And, you know, you just have to start somewhere and that's, that's toys. And, you know, we're happy to say right. we have Absolutely. four and five year olds that can use this thing. Right. And if a four and five year old can use it, you know, any adult can. So it's really just about the content. We Although bring. that might be questionable. Sometimes our, yeah. our, our, our young girls are like, you know, running circles around the adults occasionally. Well, so. they are, but at the same time, Tracy, you know, I have this, I, we end up with a lot of 3D printers here and I took one and shipped it to my nephews recently. And, you know, it doesn't have the original packaging. It doesn't have, I don't have the original setup guides and all that stuff. And I'm thinking through how to explain to them how to set this up and use it and print something. And it's quite complex. I ended up recording a video for them and I'm still going to need to get on zoom with them and be tech support for them to get to the point where they can print. So, so this I, is easier. This yeah, is, much toy is easier. so much easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I can, that's my point. <laughs> I can show you guys a demo if, if you want to see it. It's, well, it's quite easy to use. Let's add that to uh, the blog post for this episode. Yeah, and we'll have a little video. demo of the video that you can send us yeah. after, and we'll include it in this episode. So we'll get a little bonus feature going for all of you out <laughs> there. You know, this is the thing is that I think there's got to be a bigger demand happening in the marketplace right now as we're starting to sort of figure out this teach from home thing and things that are going mm -hmm. on that we're getting into a place where this is becoming questions, right? So we, mm -hmm. your episode is followed is following uh, where we interviewed Mary Hadley from Maker Girl and Maker mm -hmm. Girl is offering maker classes for girls and toys and jewelry and, and home accessories and other things, but they don't have the printer. So what if you get right. really hooked and really good at the fun design side of it? And now I want a printer. 
what am I going to ask for? Right. And what is going to be easy? And what are my parents going to feel comfortable buying me? Right. Because they know they can't provide tech support because, you know, (laughs) so this is also a really good timing. I think that you guys are Mm -hmm. at this place where you've refined it to Mm -hmm. getting that hardware and software and the designs working together. Right. I, I completely agree with that. You know, uh, there's so much potential for people to be able to build now, uh, especially with the 3D printer that just works. Um, and I, I remember when we started this, a lot of people are like, well, you know, um, 3D printing is going to be really valuable when everyone learns how to CAD, right? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, like you have to teach people the fundamentals of 3D printing, not this, you know, closed system. But, you know, I think the analogy to that is, you know, we use computers and smartphones every day, but hardly anyone knows how to program or code on a command line, right? Like um, the, the technology is evolving and uh, really ideally we get this to a place where, you know, the, the printer is just a device that builds you things um, and, you know, you can find the things you want and you can design those things in a really intuitive way uh, rather than really complex um, uh, catting or, you know, a complexity of just setting up the tools to get your printer to work. Yeah, I think you're going to find a lot of hidden uh, adult users going like, yeah, I'm buying it. Like, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, <of course. laughs> yeah, I think uh, 10 to 15% of our customers are actually adults. That's right. I would <laughs> I <know>. imagine. <laughs> Well, I love that. So now you guys have done some things that have been kind of fun as you've been trying to get out there and make sure that the market knows about you. And, be, you know, this is difficult. Like our show here, we're geared to the, the I'm going to call it the, you know, the converted, the people who already think 3D printing is great, mm-hmm. right? Or at least is majorly interested in it. But you've had to, you're got, your printer is really targeted at a market that feels that they don't have in, information. They don't have an understanding of the market. They like think it's kind of cool, but they don't know. So you've had mm-hmm. to go through some, what I would call difficult and expensive models of trying to get attention in the marketplace. You've had to go through real news outlets. You've had to go and get television appearances. You've been on Shark Tank. Tell us a little bit about that path. Yeah. You know, I, I think what we're doing is we're really starting a new product category. So when people, you know, compare us to other 3D printers, it's, you know, our, our objective isn't to be the largest or the fastest printer. It's to be the one that pe- normal people can use. Um, and we're happy to say, you know, 95% of our customers have never touched a 3D printer before. You know, these are people that are leveraging 3D printing technology, but aren't like the hobbyists and enthusiasts that are just excited about 3D printing for 3D printing or for industrial applications or design prototype applications. These are people that want to build things at home and use those things. Um, so you're right. It's, um, it, it's much more difficult to do that because, um, the objective isn't, you know, this uh, constant race to the bottom with typical hardware companies or, or typical 3D printing companies where it's, you know, can you be $5 cheaper than everyone else? Uh, and then you take the market for three or four years and then a new person gets a $5 cheaper. Um, it, it's really just to provide value in the experiences. And a lot of our uh, investment goes to building those experiences. So if you want to create an action figure, you know, we have an action figure builder. Everything's guaranteed to print without support materials. If you want to draw with your finger on your iPad, you can do that and then print it. Um, but that being said, since we are catering to a new demographic, it's it, it can be extremely difficult because we're really educating these people who have never seen a 3D printer, never touched a 3D printer. And we're saying, hey, you know, you can buy this and you can print your own toys with it, right? And how do you do that, right? You know, how do you reach people that have never seen a 3D printer before that aren't searching it for it on Google? Like who's just 3D printer for kids on Google? It's a very small subset of people, right? Um, Your kid you has know. to really have asked you for that, right? Yeah, exactly, so, yeah. But that's, you know, this is the hard part. And when you're, mm. you know, in a sense, you're creating a demand for something that people don't even know they want yet, right? And it, that uh, education is expensive and, yeah. and yeah. hard. And so you've taken on that challenge, but I think your model of aligning yourself with Shark Tank and Netflix and some of these other places where you've been seen before, mm-hmm. it helps to just sort of create that idea that, oh, there's something out there I don't know about. Maybe I should investigate without having to do the yeah. full education package, right? Exactly, right. So we do a lot. Um, Shark Tank was really big for us. Um, and we were very lucky because we, um, we had just released our product and they reached out to us. Um, at the same time, um, you know, we've, we've grown pretty organically. We've obviously needed investment because it's very difficult to run a hardware company. I was, I was literally building these. We use, 
I used the rest of my money, was living on credit cards, um, you know, uh, and, you know, we got the prototype out. We sold the first versions. Our first investors were actually our customers that were just really excited about the product. So when Shark Tank contacted me, one of our investors, uh, well, customers that just became an investor, she had been through the process before. So she was able to coach me. The, the um, acceptance rates, so there's 20,000 applications a year for Shark Tank. Uh, and I think about 60 companies end up on the show. So, you know, it puts acceptance rate at like something like 0.3% or something like that. Um, so we were very lucky, uh, in kind of getting coached on, uh, how to approach that. And, you know, it's not really all about the company. It's about, you know, being able to tell a story and offer something really intriguing. Um, but yeah, you know, I think jumping back to what you were saying about how, how to educate people, it's, it's really, you know, um, any type of outreach we have, whether it's, you know, being on CNN or being on, uh, Shark Tank to, you know, just the way we craft our advertisements for the product and really make it focus on that user experience and, you know, bringing back the magic that we feel about 3D printing to somebody who's never touched it before. Um, so it's exciting to do, but, you know, it, it's a lot of legwork on the company for sure. Well, our, our, our listeners are going, did you get a deal? I'm going to have to look it up. So did you get a deal? Yeah. <laughs> we did get a deal uh, on Shark Tank. Um I don't know how much I can talk about it, but <laughs> we are not working with Kevin O'Leary right now. So I, <laughs> I can leave it, it at it, But so it, it is already aired though, right? I mean, so it's it not has. like this is a yeah. great secret. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, so, yeah. so I wrote an, a guest chapter about these short take nails that happen, but don't happen or like it doesn't quite work yeah. out. Uh, I wrote an article and I wrote a chapter in a book called As Stolen on TV. So you're not alone. <laughs> I've actually interviewed about a dozen different um, a different shark tankers who just didn't have quite the mm -hmm. experience that it appears that it is on TV. So don't worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> <Totally understand. laughs> it's, um, you know, you got to remember it's a TV show. Um, right. So, you know, it's a good way to get your product out there. Sometimes the investments can be OK. Um, most of the times I think a lot of times it can cripple the companies that accept the investments. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just about navigating that smart, uh, <laughs> you know, smart. after the show. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, good. I'm glad yeah. that you have navigated that shark waters. So, um, yeah, so the, I'm excited to understand, like, how can someone do the design work and utilize the printer. So we don't just have to use your catalog. You kind of mentioned something about using your finger. Could you go into that a little bit so that I understand how I can use it? My kid could use it or, you know, me sure. could use it creatively as I'm, well I'm, as I'm just printing I'm out. I'm still a kid. Can I yeah. just say? <laughs> <laughs> so there's really, there's, there's three ways um, people interact with the product. So the first is if you want to use it like a normal 3d printer, you want to throw your G code up there. It also accepts STLs. You can do that. So, you know, if you make a 3d model, you don't even have to slice it. You just drop it into the browser or the app. Oh, fine. Uh, <laughs> It'll slice it for you, right? You know, um, if you want to slice it, you can put it into, you know, Cura, Repetier Host, and upload the cheat code, whatever you want. Um, so the, the it still operates as a 3D printer if you wanted to, you know, but our objective was to remove all the pain points. Um, so, you know, the, the first way people interact, and usually this is what they do right out of the box, is we have a catalog of around 2,000 prints. Everything's built to, to connect. So, like, for example, this, uh, this is an action figure. Um, it has connector pieces that we know work very well for our printer uh, and everything snaps together. So, you know, from its eyes and to everything else. Is it looks like it, there's a little movement. Is that conventional hard PLA or is that it flexible is. material? Okay. It is. Yeah. Wow. So, so this is really a really made a lot of articulating joints there. Right. So this is, this is the, the reason why we, we control the experience is because, you know, when you, when you understand the 3d printer, all the way up to the top level software, you can really make amazing things that um, just work, right? So, you know, we know the nozzle size we're using, we know the printing speed, we know when to make things hollow, we know when to bridge, right? So, uh -huh. you know, this is this is all configurable with these pens that we made, right? What I'm um, loving to see about this, and, and those of you listening to the podcast, you are gonna oh. wanna go, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. <laughs> that you are so gonna good. wanna go, to the blog post on 3dstarpoint.com to see some video clips. And we can put some the yeah. big video in it, but we'll put some clips so you can just quickly see this. And some photo images. Because you're showing us some toys 
that look like toys. They don't look like 3D prints because you've combined different parts and different colors. There's articulating joints. There's movement of doors that open. There was a, uh, you know, some linked parts that must have been printed all together. I mean, this is stuff that kids are going to want. Kids play are going to want to do this. Yeah. My kids are going to demand one of these printers. Yeah, We're it's going to be on their Christmas one, list you know? now. Yeah, I know. I know. But you said you have a catalog of two thousand prints, and this was the challenge oh, when we first goodness, started the great. podcast. Like we had considered being designers that would create this high level catalog of three D prints, and what we realized is get getting prints to scale is a tremendously difficult thing. Like you know, getting them tested, getting them through the process. How many hours are you spending? designing and testing these models that you're putting into your catalog. So we've built that over uh, <laughs> I know you built it over time, years. but yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, pretty much our goal is every week we upload around seven to 10 toys. Wow. Um, uh, some of them are open source, uh, uh, but now we're really getting into making toys. Um, so, so things like this with articulating joints, you know, what we strive for is really a whole nother level of 3D printing where, you know, we we push the status quo and we can do that because we understand our printers really well. And we can say, you know, we know exactly how much tolerance to put in these, to have these articulating joints that hold its position. Oh, afterwards. That's that I don't, I want to really emphasize this point for people. Okay. Because this has been one of the huge problems with, you know, open source 3d printers and models is that, you, you know, the model that you make and print on your printer and then you upload it to a library of, you know, okay. files and somebody else prints on another printer, it doesn't come out the same a lot of the time. And right. I remember mm -hmm. I've done this myself. I, I created this coffee sleeve, you know, a few years back that mm -hmm. was all these different interlocking parts and it was meant to be simple. Just print it once, boom, take it off the bed, use it as a coffee sleeve. It was collapsible, meaning you could, you could fold it and stick it in your pocket. But it, there were some people that printed it and it just did not work. Like it was all stretched you know? out. And, it was like, and it was, so by controlling yeah. the entire environment from start to finish, you're making 3D printing predictable exactly. for anybody who purchases your printer. And that predictability, I think, is probably as important as anything else that you've done. I mean, I, I know right. you probably agree with me because you 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 guys are making the the models, right? Mm -hmm. And and as you just said, that tolerance, knowing that you that the tolerance is consistent mm -hmm. from printer to printer, is huge. Right. So obviously there's a little bit of variance per printer, but we know what that variance is, right? So when we started this, people said you aren't going to be able to make toys because the tolerances aren't injection molding quality, but it's not about that. It's, you know, about knowing what those tolerances are and being able to work in those confines, right? So, you know, like, like we know that this pin connector that we made will work on all of our printers consistently, you know, because they are built with the tolerances of, you know, 3D printing. And even injection molding has tolerances, right? It you know, they're does. much smaller, but, uh, you know, it's something you have to account for. And uh, kind of the way we teach our designers is, you know, operate with a new status quo, you know, the things that you see in the 3D printing community. And there's really great stuff out there. And, you know, we've built on open source and open source is going to continue to drive most innovations in 3D printing. Uh, but, you know, being able to have that predictability, it's not about control, it's about the end user experience, right? And, you know, knowing every step in the process from the content to the software we build on top, uh, all the way down to the hardware is extremely important to build really high quality things that people can enjoy. Um, so that's, that's really how we look at the whole thing. And, you know, sometimes we get hate for it. Um, some, sometimes people are just like, Oh, you're just trying to control the whole experience and lock people out. It's not the intention at all. You know, <laughs> a lot of people they'll respond to our Facebook ads and be like, you know, they're forcing you to buy their filament. They're forcing you to, you know, print from their catalog. 
which we don't do, right? You know, we actually, you know, you can use it with other filaments. You know, we prefer people use ours because we don't want nozzles to get jammed from cheap filament, but people are free to do We're what they want. They can upload their own. consistent, right? Like yeah. reducing yeah. your variables. I'm... When we have to buy a different filament than we bought in the past because of supply chain issues or whatever availability, yeah. it like bu- bugs us because we were- Yeah, like, it's a shot in the dark. Just, it's like Yeah, I want something mm-hmm. that I know is going to work. And in fact, I've always, this is no- um, no great revelation to our listeners, but longtime mm-hmm. listeners of WTFFF know I'm always an advocate for buying quality filament. I don't mm-hmm. care how, I really literally don't care how much your roll of filament is per spool. If the right. quality is good, I'm going to buy it and use it because when it comes down to the amount I use per part and the real cost difference per part, we're, we're talking cents, not dollars usually, and mm-hmm. it does not matter to me at but all. But your time so, is more valuable if you're yeah, uncomfortable. Oh my yeah. gosh, the, the well, hassles I mean, yeah. are not worth it. Yeah, I mean, what's the point of buying a roll for, you know, $5 cheaper if halfway through your five-hour print, it, it clogs and you have to print another, you know, half well, roll from it. And what I would also say, I mean, and this is obviously an experienced and a converted mm-hmm. user's statement, but mm-hmm. if you are selling filament for your printers and it costs $5 more a spool than somebody else's, I am willing to spend that because I know you had to put in a lot of time and effort in order to make sure it's going to work right. But what I really also respect about what you've done is that you've allowed those of us that might have an interest and the knowledge to, whether it's create our own CAD file or want to use a different filament and we have the experience and knowledge to do it, you've allowed a way to do it. That's something that has really bothered me about certain other 3D printers. It's like, you know, oh, I'm having to like hack the system to try to do it. And I don't right. want to do that. I wish you made at least a path for me to do it, which mm-hmm. you've done. So yeah, right. you would, you would not believe the amount of work that goes into just making the filament consistent, right? Consistent oh, actually, all the way through, would, hardness, because... soft. Oh, you well, we might, but our listeners may <laughs> not. Our listeners may yeah. not, but no. we, we actually did that early on. We went to a filament factory. We watched everything. We learned about tolerances. Mm. We actually helped we advise a couple of some factories. We created custom and, colors. Oh, it's yeah, yeah. I mean, so it was... it's, yeah, we, we designed the colors, which so are hard to get consistent. it's not easy yeah. to it's be not, consistent. Yeah. And when I actually have had problems with some spools that I've bought and tested, it's clearly a difference in diameter or ovality or something in the filament. Yeah. So that's yeah, right. when you find out. a good filament supply, it's like, I want to keep buying that over and over. <laughs> that's why we yeah. get frustrated when it happens. But, you know, I do want to talk a little bit about the international supply chain. So ha- sure. the supply chain may be having a problem for you in terms of making sure you get all the parts and everything mm-hmm. that you do. Let us know about that if that's the case. But the reality is what I want people to realize out there is that the toy market as we head into the holidays here is going to have a limited supply. Mm-hmm. So there's going to be a little bit of frustration from everyone going, wow, I can't get this cool toy that I would like. Wouldn't it be great if the smart manufacturers worked with you to make sure that they could be available you know what? even when there is a supply? That's actually brilliant, Tracy. If I were you or your marketing department, I would really be making a lot of noise about, because we're already, we are hearing even in, the national media, if you watch national media, we're hearing that inventory is going to be an issue this holiday season. So why not take it into your own hands? I mean, even an, an active parent who wanted to buy such a toy could buy it with a little time in advance, print a few toys so that the kids don't just unwrap the thing to make toys on the day. Mm-hmm. They actually unwrap a few toys. Look, you can make things like this. Let's go pick some and do it. Right. It, it could be. But I, I think it, it goes to the point that you've also made here is that when comp- corporations don't make their parts available in a 3D print model or they don't make they don't allow their toys to be 3D printed, then mm-hmm. we have an issue when there's a supply chain problem. And you created a, a possibility for that to go away if they decide to cooperate. And then you right. don't have to work quite as hard to do the design work on your 
own, right? Wouldn't it be great exactly. if they would cooperate with you? <laughs> we um we have some big news in the pipeline, but I can't talk oh, about it yet. But that's uh, you're, you're touching so on some subjects that yeah, and you know that should be done by uh, this holiday season. So you know some some well, very that'd be familiar fun because brands. you know there was when Tracy told me, hey, we're going to be interview who we're going to be interviewing, and that you know it's about Toybox, the studio printer that is specifically um designed to be printing mm -hmm. toys uh which i by the way i think is also just brilliant any other 3d printer manufacturer should take note focus on a niche and do it incredibly well i think it's it was a wise idea but that there a few years ago there was a lot of media noise and buzz in the industry about i think it was a mattel uh 3d mattel, printer yeah. that never about that came before, to yeah. be that never came to be we were waiting for it and <laughs> hoping for it and you know they were i'm sure came across many challenges like you've experienced and maybe mm -hmm. the bar was too high for them i don't know um it would but surprise i think them, that but. the reason that we were interested in it is the same reason that we think you're successful here ben and mm -hmm. that is because we realized that only a company with big resources with this kind of mindset of how it, how consumer friendly it needs to be and a toy company mm -hmm. understands that mm -hmm. we're going to get the idea that all your ecosystem had to be tight like everything yes. just really had to work <laughs> So you learn, you've learned that along the way and you worked really hard to make that happen. So, so impressed with that. So, yeah. And I have but they to, should have been able to do it and they crashed sure. on it. So, yeah. I, you know, I wrote an, the only blog post I've ever done is specifically about that. Um, you know, essentially I just quit my job at Microsoft to do this full time and the news hit a couple of days later. Oh, um, no. <laughs> you know, so I went to my team and I was like, well, what are we going to do? Expecting them to, you know, say, well, you know, they're doing it. We're done, you know? Um, and this is when I knew I had a good team when they were like, so what if they're doing it? We'll do it better. Right. And really gets you thinking, you know, there, there are these companies with large amounts of resources, but think about who's, who's running them. I mean, uh, like who, who's running that division? Was it someone who really cared and, you know, uh, to the point where they're working 90 hours a week to, to bring this to life and bring this to the world? Or, you know, is it someone that had an idea and said, Hey, you guys need to build this, right? Like there's, there's really no concept of unlimited resources. Even in these big companies, you have, you know, budgets for projects and you have, you know, the chain of command, you know, and I've seen, I've worked at a big company. I've seen great ideas get killed, you know, because of politics. Uh, it's not just politics, they come to resistance, right? And that's mm -hmm. what they did here, right? Or, it was harder than they thought it was going to be. They, they yeah. say, oh, we're going to do it, but we're going to do it our way or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've seen that too. So wait a second. I want to make sure I we understood you properly and I make sure our listeners understand. Are you saying the day the news broke about the Mattel printer was yes. a couple days after you left Microsoft? To do yes. this full time. Wow. Yes. I'm sure your parents were like, oh no. Right? Their family your parents and friends. Were yeah. like, this is disaster. But but I Good agree. Good for you. I, I think well, my great. parents, my parents are great. They they let me do whatever I want. So <laughs> they've been pretty I'm glad off. you have a good support system. But it, <laughs> yeah. that's really that's a testament to the power of how much they you and your whole team has believed in the power mm -hmm. of what you could create here. And honestly, we've seen a lot of printers, we've seen a lot of things, and and you have done something special here, Ben and you should Thank all you. be proud and of it. I and really, we'd like to see well, the industry and the consumer market start supporting that. <laughs> yeah, and I honestly, even, even having our daughters who are grade school age, okay, mm -hmm. they're elementary school age, um, they have an interest in building things. Our 11-year-old had just, she took the Maker Girl course, um, you know, on, you know, you using, school, yeah. using Tinkercad and creating things. And when she wants to build something, uh, print something, she still needs my help with the 3D printers we have, mm -hmm. right? Because it is not that easy. So I just, and I, I have to, admitting to our users, I haven't used your printer yet. I think it's going to change really quickly. But um, <laughs> it, is it as simple for them as really dragging and dropping something to print it on the printer? It is. Yes. See, that makes a difference. Because if these kids can explore their creativity and these kids are smart and a lot She's i mean like, not just our kids a lot of these kids this age group they're smart they're getting smart. on and building entire worlds in minecraft 
mm-hmm. and doing similar things in Roblox. Where I have to admit, I haven't seen that one. Roblox, I don't it Minecraft, yet, but they're doing they're it. You're getting the building so concept. It is not even Fortnite. Even Fortnite, yeah. yeah, yeah. Be, ours is not on that one as much, but our, our nephews are. But yeah. seriously, for they, if they have the ability to go and print something themselves and do it themselves then they're going to do it. So then and I think the next thing on our list is we're going to have to talk to their papa, my dad, to building them a proper compost to recycle the materials because we'll have so much of it in our house. So The kids never throw anything away. What are you talking about? <laughs> we'll be oh, you'll over. just have a lot of toys. You would not believe how many I have. <laughs> we're gonna, oh, I know. Believe me, we actually moved in the last month our, our mm-hmm. home from doing this, and my 3D printing area was full of i can't even tell you how many sample prints of things that i've been saving forever and i'm just like am i still going to save this and i didn't <laughs> yeah. want to throw the stuff out i mean believe me it was it was an issue but yeah i know the more you get into the more stuff you make but yeah i'd love for the kids to be making their own stuff more <laughs> on their own yeah, I would mm-hmm. love for that too. So Ben, I think you're really onto something. Toybox is amazing. I'm really excited to share this with all our listeners and make sure that they see all the prints that you can do and they get a, get to see these printers. But you know, what's the challenge for you going forward? And is there anything that our community can do to help champion that? You know, uh, we have a lot of things in the pipeline that we're pretty excited about. I think, you know, we've been just selling in the U.S. Um, going international is definitely on our radar right now, uh, being in brick and mortar. So, we you know, the, the, the hardware is to a place that, you know, we feel pretty good about the reliability and um, the ease of use. Uh, so uh, brick and mortar is coming next year. We have a version two that will come out probably about mid next year. Um uh, so those are the big things on my radar right now. Licensing deals in the pipeline, uh, you know, more is better for those. Um, yeah. But yeah, really just getting the word out there and getting kids excited about printing is what we're excited about. Well, you Fantastic. all heard that here. So your job is to go out there and get more kids and families yeah. excited about this, you know, and, you know, we're the experts in the marketplaces, right? All our communities come to us the, you know, not just us, I'm listening, I'm looping all of you listeners out there. Cause you know, that's the first thing is you get a message that says, Hey, I'm thinking about buying a 3d printer for my 14 year old. Oh, what should I buy? Right. It just happened to us with a friend that we've known since college. She was asking know. for one for herself. Yeah. Right. And, and so what, you know, and, and so, you know, here we've had such a hard time as experts of recommending mm-hmm. a printer that's easy enough for for, for that community to use, for those type of consumers, for those type of kids, for those families mm. to use. So now we all have a choice. Nah. <laughs> Happy to support that. If uh, if you guys want to get at one, um, you could probably, re- should I say my email on this? <laughs> no, nope, well, don't save it. <laughs> you may regret that, but. <laughs> yeah. Support at make.toys. All right. We'll, we'll hook you up. Support say you're from the WTFFF podcast you know, and we'll know. Yeah. And right. you'll know you heard it here. So, okay. Yeah. So they've shared a link. We'll make sure to put that in the blog post for this episode, because all of you who's, you know, listening from, uh, from, uh, you know, your car, if you're lucky enough to be out somewhere or, or on the treadmill, we want to make sure that you, uh, have the link. So they will all be in the blog post and we'll make sure that that gets out there as well. So mention sure. the WTFFF and, uh, they'll, they'll get you connected up so you can make a good recommendation for a printer in the future. Ben, Thank you so much for coming on and sharing Toy Box. Tracy and Tom, thank you very much. How fun was that, Tom? I told you Toy Box. I mean, this is a cool, it was, cool printer. It was great fun. What's so exciting is to not only be able to learn about and talk about something new. I, that's always exciting. But to see how he's done it. He's, you know, he's obviously a tech guy, but he's, taking the right approach he's not trying to be all things to all markets right i mean this is brilliant because you're also as a company he's not going to try to take a market share that's already got so many players you know battling for it he's creating a new market and doing it extremely well right and that's yes. always the sign when you do something extremely well like you're really delivering that that absolute product. So it's not a, oh, it's okay. At least it's a toy. It's, oh, it's cool. This is the toy I wanted. Like it's better than I imagined it could be. And that's what I think they're delivering. They're delivering surprise and delight. And when does 
a product that delivers surprise and delight, not work with kids, right? Like this always yeah. works with our kids. So I know our daughter is going to be salivating when she sees this. And when that printer shows up here for you to do a test, which we're going to do, right? Well, we're going to so do that's the thing, you know, we, we did not, we were not able to get one and try it out before. And there actually is a lot that we didn't talk about with Ben. There's their, their app, their software interface, the ease of use. And we've learned about these things from Ben, but we decided to save that for an upcoming episode because we are getting a printer. We made the decision we're buying it. Then this is not one where he's sending it to us for free. That does happen sometimes, but we wanted to buy it. And yeah, because we're, we're going to keep it for keep it. Linnea. And right. that's the difference that we're also going to do here is that instead of me being, you know, the co-host to that or you doing it solo, we're going to have Linnea in on it. So our, our 11 year old is going to come in on it and test some of the printer, maybe be our demo model, printing stuff out, using the pro the app and the product and all of that, how all of how the ecosystem works. So you can really see how easy it is. And we can see how much kids really like it. So I think that's a really important idea here. You know, I said this during the interview, but this is the printer that experts like us can recommend to everyday people interested in 3D printing. And we get that question every day. Yeah, there are lots of people that ask, you know, hey, what printer do you recommend? And it becomes this very long conversation about, all right, what do you really want to do with it? <laughs> How are you going to create models? Or are you just going to print things that exist? How much you know tech can you handle you know i mean there's just a whole host of questions and are you is one color okay do you need more than one color are you gonna i mean it just gets to be this level of complexity that when people are not techie to be able to help themselves when things get a little complicated well how many of it's you very out there, hard to recommend something how many of you out there have recommended it and then had to be the tech support right so see that that happens too <laughs> that I, I don't want to recommend a printer that they're going to be calling me for tech support i need something that's just going to work that's right that's right i love that model but you know this is the other thing that i kept thinking about it's like this is a good entry point right and that's one of the things that we're always trying to create for our daughter linnea because she specifically has very creative interests but she also has great technical skills like she's been testing out Tinkercad. She gets how it works. She's starting to learn this. She builds in Minecraft. You know, all of those things are, are, she's got good instincts for it already and she has an interest in it. So how do we though give her that success feeling of, wow, it printed out? Because if they're frustrated as they're doing it, especially with girls, because we find this is the case, they'll just go on to something where they get success faster, right? And so when we can build something, <coughs> excuse me, when we can design something, make something, find something, whatever that is, and then get into the immediate gratification of it, doing something really well, it's now going to lead to this thought process, this creative thought process, which I love to engender in my daughters and in kids in general. But this idea that, wow, if I could make that, I'm wondering if I could create something on my own to do this. And so I love that there's that future being able to actually do that with the same printer. So they don't have to think about what else to buy. They can now expand their creative and technical skills on the CAD side and still use the same printer. I think that that's really great there, Tom, don't you? I do. It's, you it's know, growth built in. What's really refreshing because we've, we've experienced a lot of different companies in this industry. Yeah. We've reviewed a lot of different printers some of them are we've defunct, reviewed, I found. <laughs> we've reviewed software for printing, you know, your slicing softwares or, you know, open and closed systems, whatever. We've reviewed software for creating CAD models. We've reviewed CAD model libraries. Right. And it is really refreshing to see someone who not for their own selfish purposes is creating something a certain way or they have a certain philosophy or they have, you know, a certain experience that leads them to have a very narrow perspective. It's really refreshing to see Ben and his co-founders who've created this company really think about the entire user experience 
That's the key here. And the really entire user experience. The user and wants. not only in doing that for this new market that they are creating, of, of there are there is a market out there. They just don't know they want to buy it yet, and they will, and it'll be so easy. It, it's going to be very successful. But to then have the foresight and the initiative to allow those of us that can do more, want to have more control, want to do things a little differently, to be able to do it. That I'm, I'm really impressed. I don't think I've seen that in any other company or I don't 3D think seen it printer really. no. ecosystem. And I'm going to call this an ecosystem and not just a 3D printer because it is an entire ecosystem. They haven't said, all right, we're building the printer, but we're not going to build our own software because that's too hard. Or my favorite, the ones that are like, we're building a printer. You can put anything on it you want. You can design anything. You can make anything. You can do anything. Like, what, yeah, it's too what open. You, but that's the thing. People are always asking, what am I going to make? If you're leaving that question to the consumer, you are going to have a very hard time selling your product because you're not giving them a reason why. They've said, you know what? It's toys. We're focusing on toys. We're going to kill it with toys. Well, not just that. They're putting out seven to 10 toys per week. And he didn't really answer the question about how many hours it takes to design them because I'm sure it's all over the place depending on what they're working on. But you and I know that it can be up to, to 100 hours to really get a good design, especially one, even though they've got their tolerances dialed in and they're probably using common, common well, snap-on and joints and things. and things. I mean, I'm sure it's gotten easier now that they created the systems for it. But those first ones, I'm sure, took a long time. And I'm sure they've got a, a handful at least of, if they're putting out seven to 10 a week, They've got a, quite a department of full-time employees doing this. Yeah, because we had, we tried it. We we were looking at doing that. That's why WTFFF happened. We were thinking about starting that kind of design firm. But right, we were only thinking of doing the creation of the files to print side of it. We were not creating the whole system to right, print which is where well, we realized it started right? to fall apart right. right with and we didn't want to take all that on so that's why we've never done that so i'm so glad somebody really took it on from that holistic perspective in the ecosystem and so toy box can't wait for you to see this can't wait for you to see all the add-ons that are in there there's extra video footage there's extra images don't forget you got to go to the video if you haven't seen this you got to go to the blog post for this episode at 3dstartpoint.com and really check out the articulating arms on some of those toys and i mean there's just going to be so much for you to see and ben's offered us a coupon for all of you who are interested in buying this for your family for your kids for yourself maybe out there he's offered us a coupon uh, for 50 dollars off i think he said it was i think it's it a is good, yeah. decent discount. so go to the blog post at 3dstarpoint.com to see all that information that's where it all is you got to go there to get it and you know what you have more to look forward to because there is another episode in the not too distant future coming about all those things that we hadn't talked about yet. The user interface, the apps, the browser, you know, how the experience of using it is, is something else to look forward to. So, right. And if, if you're listening to this and you have some daughters, don't forget to listen to the episode before with maker girl, um, because there's a great tie in between maker girl and toy box here. So you might be able to create these girls that then become make, you know, start printing and then become makers. So if you've got it, if you've got that going on, go check that one out as well. So thanks everyone for listening. I'm so excited to be back with you and bringing in some cool things when I'm, when we find them here at 3d start point at WTFFF. All right, everybody, until next time, this is Tom and Tracy on WTFFS.